This recorded program as Muslim American leaders are about to hold a press conference to announce a national campaign combating terrorism and violence. The Freedom Foundation of the Muslim American Society is hosting the event live from the National Press Club. Let me get one more person. Hood, please, you have to stand with us. And your wife can join us, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And if you, and once again, we need about another minute. We have one more person who's down in the parking lot. She'll be coming right up, and then we're going to get started. Okay. spectacles over here. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't forget them though. Okay, if we can. Well, no, it's okay, I just come over on the side, it's gonna be fine. Okay, let me see. Have I missed anything? And there's a map inside of all of the folders that show where our use centers are. Okay, all right, so people, you can make reference to the map if you need to do this. So. I've got one document I need to have with me, and then we're gonna get started. Okay, I guess we are starting. He can join us when he arrives, and we'll, we'll do that. Let me just put this over to the side here. Sensitive, okay. All right. you, okay? you okay now? I'll try to cut down on the shuffling and the rallying of papers here. In fact, if I could move this out of the way, it might be a lot easier. Just a little bit, it's somewhat just a little tighter. There you go. Maybe. Okay. <clears throat> All right. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, we want to welcome you to this uh, press briefing on our efforts within the Muslim American society and the Muslim community to combat global terrorism. We welcome the C-SPAN audience, and we are grateful that C-SPAN is carrying this event. I am Mehdi Bray, the Executive Director of the Muslim American Society Freedom Foundation, which is America's largest grassroots Muslim organization. I serve as the Freedom Foundation Director, which is the civic, educational, uh, advocacy component of the Muslim American Society. Certainly, we feel that the events most recently in London, Egypt, chronically in Baghdad or Iraq, has moved us to a different level within the Muslim community. Dr. King once said that silence 
can often be betrayal. And at least one be complicit with that betrayal, it is necessary that one speaks out very loud and clearly. We have consistently within the Muslim American society and within the American Muslim community denounced terrorism. I think one of the greatest urban legends that has somewhat seems to still resonate every now and then in the media is that where are the Muslim voices? The Muslims did not speak up against terrorism. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, on the tragic uh, day of 9-11, when terror struck the heart of America, all of the major Muslim organizations and their leaderships were assembled here in Washington, D.C. in preparation to meet with the President of the United States. So we immediately issued condemnation and immediately pledged to do all that we could to fight, to fight rather, the scourge of terrorism. However, I, I think it's important to understand that condemnation is not enough. As some people said, been there, done that. We're on a different page. We're on the page of actively and vigorously combating terrorism. Thus, we are announcing today our plan, Faith Over Fear and Justice for All, uh, which we have seven major points that we want to cover that will highlight our intensification of fighting terrorism. I think the other thing that is important to note is that there are injustices within the Muslim world. There are legitimate grievances. But one of the things that I learned a long time ago in the African American tradition in the Civil Rights Movement is that you can't fight injustice with injustice. It is not acceptable. In fact, I would go a step further to say that deliberate injustice is more fatal, ultimately, to the one who imposes it than the one on whom it is imposed. And it is from this precept that we say that those who would render violence, hatred, and the targeting of innocent civilians for murder, and that's what it is, you do no service to the faith of Islam or to any cause that you may have or any grievances that you may perceive or grievances that are real. That indeed you are a scourge upon the very tenets of Islam and you will find no comfort in our community. So let me conclude with my remarks by saying that there are two things that we want to make very, very clear. And that is that we are actively engaged in fighting terrorism. And our president, uh, who will speak after I speak, will highlight what those activities that we are proposing but at the same time, as we fight terrorism, we as Americans are also concerned that we don't terrorize the Bill of Rights and Civil Liberties. And that as vigorously as we will oppose those who want to um, participate in violence and mayhem, that we will also equally vigorously oppose those who would seek to scapegoat the Muslim community, use terrorism as an opportunity to practice bigotry, or as my grandmother would say, an old country woman trying to do something dirty and call it clean. We will vigorously oppose that, recognizing that this is not in the interest of national security, and if anything, it also contributes and exacerbates our efforts to combat terrorism. Certainly, we will make sure that any policy that con 
that is actually contrary to those dear principles that we hold so dear in this country that we will vigorously oppose anyone who wants to do that, and that includes even our own government in many cases. Uh, I think that Benjamin Franklin got it right when he said that he who is willing to sacrifice liberty for the sake of security deserves neither. So that is something that we want to make very, very clear, that our war on terrorism is also our war on bigotry and hatred. I guess from a theological standpoint, terrorism ultimately is an unloving heart, the inability to have compassion and love for your fellow human being. Let me say to the terrorists very clearly that you will have no comfort in our community. Our community offers you no harbor. Let me say it in a language that you will understand. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, once said, help your brother, whether he is right or wrong. The companions of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, O oh, messenger of God, we know how to help our brother if he is right, but how do we help him if he is wrong? Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, responded by resisting him. And indeed, we will resist you. Our message is clear. You do no service to Islam. You do a great disservice to Islam. We will resist you. And for the love of God, stop this madness. Our next speaker will be the president of the Muslim American Society, Dr. Issam Omish. Greetings <clears throat> and peace be upon all. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God the Gracious, the Merciful. I would like to add to what my dear brother Mahdi mentioned, that in the wake of the recent escalation of violence and terrorism in London, Egypt, Baghdad, and elsewhere, the Muslim American Society Mass renews its condemnation of such evil acts and renews its commitment to exonerate Islam from terrorism, deny terrorists any religious, ideological, or political legitimacy. We categorically denounce all terrorism, regardless of affiliation, religion, or national origin. You know, the Islamic discourse on the subject of terrorism and the sanctity of human life is very clear and unambiguous. And we have said it time and again that terrorist acts are utterly criminal, totally reprehensible, and abs absolutely un-Islamic. There can never be an excuse for taking innocent life and these killings have absolutely no sanction in Islam, nor is there any justification whatsoever in our noble religion for such evil actions. In Islam, ends do not justify means, and the authors of terrorist attacks and bombings are criminals, and we should not accept their justifications, whether ideological, religious, or political. Our positions have been consistent because they're anchored on solid religious moral and civic grounds. But today, as we have announced, we are moving beyond just equivocal, unequivocal condemnation as we strive to construct a partnership with all concerned parties, including our community and our government, to foster a more secure America here and abroad 
and a more prosperous, harmonious American society. We in mass are committed to proactively combating terrorism, addressing its root causes, and ridding our world from its scourge. We recognize and assert that terrorism is a complicated phenomena, and that security measures, intelligence gathering, and military might, while they're vital and crucial, alone they are not adequate solutions. And we must provide for a multifaceted, comprehensive approach to uproot terrorism completely and ensure long-term safety, security, peace, and prosperity of the American people and the world at large. As Muslims, we can no longer allow nor afford to let anybody else represent or speak on behalf of Islam and Muslims. Whether it's a Muslim who is misguided and who feeds only their narrow-minded, isolationist, destructive ideas, translating them into an action plan of criminal violence and murder, or whether it's a non-Muslim, Islamophobe, Islam bashers who twist clear Islamic facts and history to serve their extreme ideas of hate, bigotry, and racism. We are here today, the Muslim American Society, MASS, one of the largest grassroots religious, educational, and civic organization, Muslim organizations in America. We consist of over 50 chapters across the states. We have many religious schools. We have youth centers spread across the country. We have programs, Boy Scouts of America and Girl Scout of, of America programs. We have civic departments. We have advocacy groups. And our members are prominent within their communities. Our imams provide direct leadership to hundreds of mosques here in America and tens of thousands of Muslims across the continent. We at the Muslim American Society are uniquely positioned and equipped to provide a comprehensive, multifaceted approach in proactively combating terrorism and eliminating its scourge. We have been doing this for many years, years before 9-11, by protecting the mainstream Islamic community from extremism in ideology and violence in action. We have long been advancing the authentic Islamic, balanced, moderate, comprehensive, and relevant teachings and values. And we continue to champion the vision to fully and positively integrate the Muslims as exemplary citizens and contributors to the greatness of their nation and of Islam as a genuine, divinely brilliant, monotheistic component of our national heritage and world civilization. And thus, we are committed to the intensification of our efforts to proactively combat terrorism, secure our community, both internally and externally, from the vulnerabilities of extremism and bigotry. We are working with imams and Islamic centers to consolidate and solidify the prevailing, moderate, and mainstream orientation of our community. And we are doing whatever it takes to leave no chance for terrorists and their views to creep into our communities and we will leave no ambiguity when it comes to where the Islamic position is on this matter of terrorism. Mass's interpretation of Islamic scriptures and original jurisprudence and its understanding of Western liberal democracy chart a clear path for American Muslims to live an authentically Islamic life and to fully participate as American citizens while enjoying the freedoms of religion and expression. We will continue to dedicate major efforts in working, mentoring, and providing educational opportunities for young American Muslims, for our youth who are torn between the growing Islamophobia at home and between the twisted misinterpretation of their religion. Elsewhere, they are learning that in mass educational activities, that to become a genuine American citizen, one does not have to renounce one's faith. They also learn that establishing the universal values of Islam within the framework of the American constitutional and pluralistic society is indeed possible. Thousands of youth benefit every year 
from our youth centers, which are spread across the nation in cities like New York, Boston, Denver, Kansas City, Los Angeles, Chicago, and many other places across the nation. We have programs, Boy Scouts and Girl Scout mass troops are spread across the nation. We have study circles are, that are being held weekly that takes care of hundreds if not thousands of youth to teach them the balanced understanding of Islam. Mass is determined to continue to expand its training programs to train our youth on civic engagement and outreach in volunteerism, community service, and to nurture our youth to be exemplary active citizens of their society. Mass is stepping up its outreach efforts to speed up the full integration of our community, to demystify Islam and Muslims, and to deny the terrorists the community, I mean the opportunity to hijack our religion or speak on behalf of the one and a half billion Muslims worldwide. We will continue our relentless efforts to advocate justice as the precursor for social harmony and world peace. And we are aware of the rampant injustice in the world that is causing real legitimate grievances. However, as we mentioned, in Islam, ends don't justify the means, and the just causes have to be advocated through legitimate means. The senseless killing of innocent people in New York, Madrid, London, Baghdad, or Casablanca are indeed a scourge to the very causes they claim to champion. We're calling upon our Muslim community to go back to our fundamentals and basic values of Islam. We need not forget that we have a mission and a duty defined by the Almighty to us, a Muslim duty according to the Noble Quran, to bear witness to, to your faith before all mankind. We're obligated to witness our faith by being active participants of our society, to uphold justice and to defend the oppressed and the underprivileged of our society. This would be achieved by having the American Muslims becoming active citizens. Muslims must not be beaten into retreat from this mission by what's going on around us. We must not remain introverted nor selfish for we will answer to our creator for what we did with our time and resources. We no longer have the luxury of simply li lying back and complaining, even justifiably, that we are mistreated. Our central goal should be to put our great values and principles into action and make a contribution, a lasting impact on our nation and the world. Mass is calling for a summit of Muslim leadership and organizations to discuss effective strategies to protect our community and our country from terrorism and its repercussions and to exonerate our faith once and for all and our community from terrorism and to fulfill our role as a bridge of goodwill between our country and the greater Muslim world. We commit to all this and we promise in mass that we will continue to do this. We will continue to preserve mainstream moderate Islamic discourse of our community as the genuine representation of the values and teachings of Islam. We will promise to continue to nurture our youth righteously, train our community civically, sustain our efforts of outreach towards the full positive integration of Islam and Muslims in mainstream America. But we also call upon our government, and we call upon our civic leaders, we call upon our partners in the media, and we call upon our co-citizens to do and to take certain measures, both domestically and internationally. At the domestic front, we demand of our government a much better effort in dealing with Islam and Muslims. This is a call to our government to rectify any misguided policies and prejudiced implementation of national security plans, as well as a demand to include Muslims in the national debate and in the policy circles and in the decision-making arenas in homeland security and in otherwise. Engaging genuine Muslim leadership, not the manufactured leadership of the willing, nor the Islamophobic sworn enemies of Islam, but rather the principled partners in the genuine leadership of the Muslim community. This also includes putting a halt to the unfair practices 
against Muslims and the Muslim community, the unfair targeting of the Muslim organizations and the charities, and the lack of fair dealings with Muslims is indeed significant. Lastly, the government and mainstream media must play an active role in silencing the voices of bigotry and hatred well within our home here in America. Voices of religious extremism or unwarranted agenda or interest group driven attacks on Islam and Muslims have been rampant and they will only serve to sustain this vicious cycle of destruction. At the international front, as we mentioned, we believe terrorism is a complicated phenomena and it takes more than just might to fix it. And so we are adding our voice in directing our government to stop supporting tyrannical and despotic regimes across the Muslim world in a meaningful, firm manner. Repressive rulers with no regard to life, freedoms, or human rights are a central cause and perpetuators of the curse of terrorism worldwide. We ask our government to advocate the cause of freedom and democracy across the Muslim world boldly and unambiguously in line with our upheld ideals and founding principles. We call upon our government to engage mainstream Islamic movements and Islamists who are the legitimate representatives of their own people and they are the true forces of positive change across the Muslim world. This will provide us with formid formidable trusted partners, will generate substantial genuine dialogue, will dry up the wells of extremism, will isolate the terrorists and will aid in their eventual demise and elimination. We need to provide needed progress and economic recovery to that part of the world to eliminate frustration and desper desperation. And we need a more prudent international and foreign policy where America's interests are first and foremost aligned with the universal principles of justice and peace and where our international agenda is not blurred nor undermined in the Muslim world by other anti-American foreign special interest groups, homegrown or otherwise. We need to address genuine, legitimate world grievances from the plight of the Palestinian people to the legitimate struggle of the people of Kashmir to the legitimate struggle of the people of Chechnya and other parts of the world where the need for peace through an even-handed policy and an end of le illegitimate occupation of land are long overdue. We need to see our government end the unjustified wars and the hegemonic ventures across the world and partner with the world community in bringing harmony and peace and justice to all members of the human family. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that we are in mass, blessfully are poised, and we have what it takes to continue this kind of work in eliminating the scourge of terrorism, isolating this criminal behavior, its feeding ideas, and eventually weeding it out. And while we engage our community to shun extremism and uphold balanced mainstream ideas of Islam, we are actively implementing an action plan, as I mentioned. We are taking care of our youth so that they don't go astray and be allured by these violent and extreme ideas. We are engaging our imams so that we can deliver the message clearly and unambiguously to our community and to every member of the Muslim community across our great land. We are fully implementing outreach and civic training as preparing ourselves, genuinely principled partners with our government and with our civic leaders to charter the course of ultimate solution and triumph. We in mass believe that nations and groups should maintain relationships on the basis of universal brotherhood, fairness and mutual understanding, respect, and that people should pursue their interest through civic engagement within the boundaries of law. We reject this dualistic concept of us and them and the simplistic diagnosis of they hate us because of our freedom or they envy us because of our prosperity. We refuse to be trapped between extreme ideas which are combating each other, providing the justifications the other desperately needs, thus creating this vicious self-feeding cycle of destruction. We instead see commonalities and shun that which tears and divides. We are in mass, are doing that every single day in our programs and throughout our communities. And as we move them into fully integrated partners 
for the peace and prosperity of our country. We draw upon our faith to combat the dark forces of extremism, bigotry, hatred, and thus we continue to embrace our campaign, faith over fear and justice for all. Faith over fear and justice for all. Thank you and God bless. My, my. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Omish. One of the things that is critical is that there is a unified front in fighting and combating terrorism. And that certainly includes people of faith, people of all faith. I am so happy to be affiliated with an organization that has consistently championed that very principle. I serve on the board of, of directors of one of America's largest interfaith organizations, the Interfaith Alliance. It has been a privilege and an honor to be a board member of the Interfaith Alliance because, as we say down in the hood, <laughs> not only do they talk the talk, but indeed they walk the walk. I'm going to call to the podium to speak Susie Armstrong, the Vice President, Interfaith Alliance. Susie, if you will. <coughs> Good morning. The Interfaith Alliance is the national nonpartisan advocacy voice of the interfaith movement. Our 150,000 members are drawn from more than 75 faith traditions. Together, we promote democratic values, defend religious liberty, challenge hatred and religious bigotry, and reinvigorate informed civic participation. Today, I join you to express the Interfaith Alliance's support for this effort to challenge terrorism perpetrated in the name of religion. It is a sad truth that most, if not all, of the world's great religious traditions have at times been abused to rationalize acts of violence. Such violence is sparked when deeply held religious beliefs are manipulated with the specific purpose of sowing hate and fear. We stand with all people of faith and goodwill who are working to put an end to terrorism. When any religion is used as an excuse for violence, all religions are debased and defiled. Bigotry, violence, and hate are neither religious nor American values. Rather, all religious communities share the common value of teaching respect and dignity for every person. The Interfaith Alliance works with faith-based organizations and individuals who serve this nation as sentinels for justice, safety, and security. We stand up against hate crimes and walk side by side with those whose religious liberties are threatened. All Americans should have the right to live without fear, without fear of being victimized because of their religion, race, or social standing. We commend the basic notion of religious freedom articulated so well in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. This nation is based on freedom for and from religion. The freedom of each faith to worship as they choose and the freedom of those who choose no religion must be upheld. This is a particularly critical issue for minority religions in this nation, the most religiously diverse nation on earth because each community requires trust in order to function, nurture families, and provide safety for every person. Religious expression in the home, mosque, synagogue, gudwara, or church is private and personal. There is no place for interference in these sacred settings from any source. As people of faith and goodwill, we stand together to send the message that terror stemming from religious bigotry must be vigorously challenged. The Interfaith Alliance supports every effort to promote peace and justice, but never at the expense of human rights and religious freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. It is important that our imams are on the front line in engaging 
this effort to combat terrorism. Why? Well, simply because they have daily contact with the community. They marry, they bury, they counsel, and they lead the Friday prayers through sermons and the actual prayer. So at this time, I'm going to call upon Imam Abdul Malik Johari, who is the president of the Coordinating Council of Muslim Organizations, but he is also a long-standing imam, having served as chaplain at Howard University, representing Masjid Dal al Hijra, also Muslims Chaplains Association, and an advisor to our own mayor of the District of Columbia as it relates to religious affairs. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, <coughs> Imam Johari to please come. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim I want to thank you all this morning for listening to this presentation with our hope that you will hear our message clearly. The message that we have identified without any doubt that there exists within our community an attitude that violence is a solution to problems. And we are saying with this campaign that we must address those human deficiencies found in people who are of every faith that would lead them into acts of senseless violence. A program designed to reach youth, to reach families, to work with clergy in the Islamic centers in order to touch young people to advise them that there are individuals among our midst who are being led not by God but by Satan. And they are being recruited away from the ideals of Islam into cults of terror. And so with our culturally sensitive social workers, psychologists, imams, counselors, it is our intent to defeat this culture of violence. I want to remind all of us today that this cult of violence is not unique to the Muslim community. Columbine had young people who felt alienated, isolated, in despair, and somehow they were able to connect with other people who would provide them with the techniques, the resources to commit acts of violence against their friends and teachers. We have observed on our reservations in America a sense of despair that young Native Americans would commit the ultimate act of destroying human life. We have seen in the world people responding to Conditions like in Palestine or in Iraq, having a sense of despair, and there are people among them who would encourage them to join cults of violence. In America, we have to take action. Perhaps there's not much that I can do about the international affairs. But in the framework of America to say that people who would go out and kill anyone of any religion, from any country, of any age, for no reason other than the fact that they are angry 
isolated and upset is against God by whatever name you call. And so we are grateful today to launch this campaign, to reach into our communities, to train our imams, to train our families to say this is not an Islamic phenomenon. It is a terror and violent phenomenon. Perhaps it is today that Muslims will take the lead and other members of our community will follow to go into their communities to help to stem this wicked trend of violence. You know, I'm very afraid to say to you that this action is not unique. It is something that all of us realize is operating in our community. And we have a common obligation to root out individuals who are in need of spiritual guidance, that they might correct their approach to solving problems, not with violence, but with conciliation. I ask God Almighty to help us in this charge. May we continue to work together until we see what the prayer of the Prophet Muhammad said. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa tabarakta ya dhal jalali wal ikram. That God is peace and God is the source of peace. And we pray for God's peace on this earth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Imam Jahari. I would like now to um, ask Hood Williams to come. Hood Williams is the youth director of the Adams Center, the All Dulles Area Muslim Society. Once again, it's important that we engage youth. I've been to so many conferences and people are always talking about youth. They're the future. They're the future. In realities, youth are not the future. They are now. They exist now. They have needs now. That's right. And they are ready now to do things. To borrow the quote with attribution from Reverend Fontroy, we want to make it very clear that Muslim youth are not terrorist suspects but they are America's brightest prospects. That Muslim youth will not be tail lights, but they will indeed be headlights. And that they will not be thermometers, but they will be thermostats. There's a difference. And this is the way that we are striving within the Muslim American society to deal with young people. So I'm very glad to uh, have a young man who has decided he would dedicate his life to working with other young people in the area of scouting, counseling, and serving as the director of the youth program at the Adams Center. Hood Williams, please come to the podium. Um, thank you all for coming today. Bismillah. Um, on July 7th, there was a bomb heard around the world, and it sent a message. It sent a message that killing innocent civilians is okay. It sent a message that Islam condones this senseless act of violence. It sent the wrong message. So right now, here at the Adams Center, at the Adams Center, and around the country, we're training Muslim youth to send another message, a message that Islam is about peace a message about what Islam truly stands for, about being involved in your community, in your government, and in, your, in different organizations like the Boy Scouts of America. And so we're working with Mass and other organizations, other Muslim organizations, to really engage the youth to be a part of the broader Muslim community and American community. And so we thank Mass for that Faith Over Fear um, program, and we'll definitely be a part of it at the Adams Center. Thank you. God bless you, young man. Well, we're rolling with youth. Let's stay consistent. 
uh, a youth leader in the student capacity. She is the vice president of the Muslim, Muslim Student Association at Georgetown University. Dania Ayubi. I'm going to ask Dania Ayubi to come to the podium. She is indeed the vice president of the Muslim Student Association at Georgetown University. Peace and greetings be upon you. As was mentioned, I am the Vice President of the Muslim Students Association at Georgetown University. As a representative of my local MSA, I'm speaking here today as an ambassador of my generation and would like to express the sentiment shared by myself and my peers regarding the barbaric attacks against all innocent people of the world. Attacks that have blindly killed scores of individuals from Bali to New York City to Sharm el-Sheikh to London. Muslim students across the country firmly and resolutely condemn such acts, acts that terrorize and are destructive, acts that stem from hate-filled ideology, acts committed by certain individuals who claim to be operating in the name of Islam. As Muslim youth in America, drawing from our religious teachings, we believe that all forms of extremism are not to be tolerated and are not permissible for any Muslim. Looking upon the sources of our beautiful tradition, we, believers in the message of the Qur'an, denounce all indiscriminate violence targeted against civilians and denounce the radical ideology which has motivated a minority of individuals with no regard for human life. Muslim students understand that Islam has been hijacked by a fringe minority of extremists who believe Islam excuses their abhorrent actions. We also know that measures must be taken not only to combat these atrocious attacks on innocence, but also address the misuse and abuse of the great traditions of Islam. Now, however, the time for mere condemnations is over. As key players in today's society, we are working to foster a dialogue based on honesty so as to promote a real and deep understanding of Islam. It is through this healthy exchange of ideas that we want to clarify what it is Islam really stands for. Through the beautiful tradition of Islam, which preaches respect, justice, and tolerance for all of humanity, we seek to engage in a society that honors the golden rule, a society in which we, the youth of this country, are coming onto the scene. As Muslim youth, we are vibrant, active, moderate, aware, eager, and seek the power to create change facilitate a more peaceful and tolerant environment and become the voice for the youth of our community. The MSA is a vital vehicle by which to promote this plan. American Muslim students are currently seeking increased political and social integration into the tapestry of American society. We are defining an American Muslim identity and with it an American Muslim culture. Through this integration and redefinition, we hope to become the agent required to remedy the misconceptions of Islam, misconceptions held by Muslims and others alike. People of all beliefs and traditions must stand together in these times of uncertainty and sorrow. But we students, the future of tomorrow, believe that our work today will help create a more just and peaceful tomorrow. It is on this hope that we work for a brighter future, our future. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I often tell people that as a Muslim and an African American, I carry the double whammy. I have to worry about driving while black and flying while Muslim. I say that to say because for many of us who came through the civil rights movement, we've known terrorism in this country long before September the 11th. I can think of my own house being firebombed by the Klan simply because my grandfather was registering African Americans to vote and a distant relative bludgeoned to death in Moyork, North Carolina, working for the NAACP. So we were able to defeat the Klan and the racist ideology of bigotry, hatred, and violence, and we didn't do it with violence. That's right. We didn't do it with violence. And here to encapsulate that movement uh, is a person certainly no stranger to that struggle. He is 
Reverend Walter Fontroy, former member of Congress, serving 20-some years in Congress, one of the original founders of the Congressional Black Caucus, and currently the leader and the chairman of the National Black Leadership Roundtable. I'm going to ask Reverend Fontroy to come to the podium. Thank you, my brother Imam Bray, to my Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, to my fellow Americans here and around the world. What I've heard here today has been music to my ears. Music to the ears of one who over the past more than 45 years has been the pastor of a Christian church in our nation's capital. The first decade spent as Martin Luther King Jr.'s personal representative to the presidents of the United States, to the leadership of the U.S. House and Senate, and to the heads of the cabinet level agencies that had impact upon our struggle in the decade of the 60s. The decades of the 70s and 80s were spent as a member of the Congress of the United States, a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus, chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus in the decade of the 80s, and one who launched the Free South Africa Movement with my arrest at the South African Embassy. Because of my commitment uh, to my role as a member of the Abraham Federation. All Muslims, all Christians, all Jews claim that Abraham is the father of the faith and that Moses is the lawgiver and that he didn't give ten suggestions. He gave ten commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Not suggestions. The commandments because there are consequences to killing. There are consequences to lying. There are consequences to coveting and stealing. And so I'm as pleased as I can be to stand with the Mass uh, Freedom Foundation and Society. I salute them for their honor and their courage in coming forth to tell the truth in love and to face a stark reality with courage. The fact is that all of us, Muslims, Christians, and Jews who know our God and know our faith, understand that you judge people not on the basis of what they say they believe, but what they do. In the vernacular of the street, Mr. Say ain't nothing, Mr. Do's the man. And we are to be not hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. And I associate myself with this magnificent effort that has garnered the, the support of every true Christian, every true group, Jew, who understands what Micah indicated when he said, what doth the Lord require of you? But that you do three things, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I'm here because Jesus instructed me to beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, and yet in their hearts are they ravenous wolves. I am so tired of what we call in the black community jack leg preachers and jack leg imams and jack leg rabbis who talk east and walk west on the basic tenets that, that that lead us and guide us and instruct us as members of the Abraham faith tradition, as members who value the, the teachings of Moses, the law of Moses, as delivered by the one God that we all embrace. And so I, I come finally to thank you particularly for the role you are giving our young people. I, with Martin Luther King Jr., the singularly the most important man with the most important message for the most violent century in the history of mankind, whose message was either we learn to live together as brothers and sisters on this planet or we will perish together as fools. In the name of God, in the name of Martin Luther King Jr., I welcome 
a generation of young people who have decided on their watch what Martin Luther King Jr. and us decided in the decade of the 60s. Not on our watch. Are we going to put up with the bigotry and hate and injustice inflicted upon people of African descent in America? And because we acted out of our faith, our Abrahamic faith, black and white together, Jew and Gentile together, because we acted, we changed America. As Dr. King said, turn it upside down and right side up on the question of civil rights. Thank you for a generation of young people who've decided on their watch. We are not going to put up with people who use religion as excuses to take five things from other people. Income, education, healthcare, housing, and justice. I stand with you as you go forth to be uh, headlights and not tail lights. As you go forth to be thermostats and not thermometers. Thermometers measure the temperature in a room. Thermostats set it. Thank you for setting the noble temp temperature that's going to redeem America and the world of the foolishness of Ku Klux Klan-like people who use religion as an excuse to kill. Thank you, Dr. Fontroy. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that one person who wanted to be here so desperately but had a previous commitment could not be here but did indeed call to express his solidarity in standing with us. He's always been that way. He is indeed Rabbi Jack Moline, who is also with the Interfaith Alliance. Um, and that's not anything unique about Jack. I remember when 9-11 occurred, I think we all remember exactly where we were. And in less than maybe an hour after that tragic event, I received a phone call. Came from Jack, Rabbi Jack Malane, Malene, rather. And he asked, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? How can I help? And that's always been Jack's way. And so even though he's not here standing with us, he's here in spirit, and we certainly appreciate his support and his stand in our campaign of faith over fear and justice for all. We are trying to keep this down to an hour, so we are running really, really short on time. So we're going to take a few questions, and then what we will do is that we will um, have all of our panelists available for some one-on-ones if there are additional questions, but we had promised faithfully that we would uh, try to stay within an hour with C-SPAN. Yes? For the Imam Jahari, please, if you could come to the microphone. How do you expect to reach youth quickly and interrupt the message of violence that they seem to be getting from elsewhere to, to preclude it? Well, I think uh, our approach, fortunately, is having the benefit of a network of community-based youth centers around the country with mass. Uh, I, I, I w remember doing so many fundraisers to help <laughs> establish these centers so that I could say now today with confidence that if you want to go to New York, if you want to go to Chicago, if you want to go to Cleveland, if you want to go to Houston, and you will find a robust and active youth community. I don't know if the one in, Cal in uh, California is built yet, Mass with 50 chapters around the country with, with mosques that are associated with them to be able to send that message in a very deliberate way to our imams and directly to the youth coordinators like Hood in those communities to convey this seven point plan. Imam, following up, what would you want? Or are you going to actively um, send out the message to the youth, to everyone across the country? Uh, in mosques across, across the country, if they see the seeds of terrorism forming, to report that to the authorities. I mean, I hear you talking about this being called a curse and so forth, but I don't hear you encouraging people without a doubt to report it. If they see it, I, I, and if they I, do, I can give you a real life example. I was in the mosque. I was in the mosque two nights ago. 
A young man came to me in the parking lot after the mosque closed. He said, Imam, I have been, tr some people have tried to recruit me. I said, really? Yeah, such and such a person. I said, okay, can you tell me who they are? I said, well, I don't feel comfortable to tell you who they are, but what should I do? They told me they want me to share with them certain people and how to work with them. I said, well, brother, I'm telling you. He said, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. I said, you need to alienate yourself from those people. Clearly, they have another agenda. They're saying to you that they're your friend and that, they, and that you'll be their confidant, when in reality, they're going to sell you out. I know I have experience. Once that door is open for that dialogue, then it's simple. Now, if we need law enforcement, and young people say there's someone who I know who's involved in something that's going to destroy not just other people, but Muslims are going to suffer as well. I want you to remember when you look at this cycle of violence, why I call it a terror cult, is that they kill people of their own faith along with other people. So that can't, there can't be this sort of puritanical, uh, ideological bond that says, we'll kill other people, but we'll save ourselves. There seems to be an anger that says, we'll kill anyone who's in our environment because we're so angry. And so that means that they have to be turned in. And the first line of defense, so that young people are not deceived, is to go to people in leadership that have been, they have built relationships with. So a Hood, Williams and Adams Center, a young person can come to Hood and say, we just had last night an overnight uh, uh, youth activity. He's built the bonds of communication with them. They feel open. And then to be able to say, Hood, somebody came to me and they invited me to some secret meeting. Do you know these people, et cetera, et cetera? And Hood then can identify these two people. We don't know what they're doing, but they're not a part of us. They're not on our agenda. Let me step aside and let somebody else. If I could just quickly follow up too. I think what's also important, uh, it's a two-way street. Uh, we have a responsibility to engage law enforcement, but law enforcement, That's especially right. on the national level, has a responsibility to engage us in a proper way. In the proper way. And the thing that I think has been most disturbing to the Muslim community is that this Justice Department and this aspect of the law enforcement has engaged us from the back door rather than the front door. See, we need to make it very, very clear to the Justice Department and the law enforcement that we don't need green cards or promises of citizenship or some type of uh, jury rigging of immigration status in order for us to do the right thing. We are citizens here. Uh, we are residents here. We love this country. We'll do the right thing because we're obligated by God to do the right thing. So rather than spending all their energies in terms of recruiting spy, spies and snitchers, they need to spend more time and more energy engaging the authentic Muslim leadership. That's an important aspect of fighting terrorism, but it's a two-way street. Yes, please. Nasser Hussein from Al Jazeera, Washington. Could you please tell us, since you are the people at the front war on terror in mosques now, could you tell us who these people are? Who is trying to hire who here? Could you be more specific, please? <laughs> I guess of your example that you just talked about last week. Who I mean, the authorities people? always talked about sleeping cells, etc., etc., but nothing was maybe outspoken. Such well, I can tell you. Could, could you, could you no, that, and, and I, I, first, without a doubt, there have been young people who have come to me who say that they have been approached by federal agents to be spies in the mosque. I want to warn them that they don't know whether those people are federal agents or whether they're some other kind of agent. And so to take money from them or the promise of citizenship or whatever uh, is a risk that they take. Be better to come to us. I, and, and perhaps I can turn this over to Dr. Sam, I have never encountered anyone who told me and I think I travel across the country, I have a good reputation among the Muslim community. I never had anyone come to me and say, brother, do you know there are two people there in Al-Qaeda, there in our mosque? Never. So, I mean, whatever it is, it's buried very deep because I have never had anyone come to me and say that I was someone attempted to recruit me for Al-Qaeda. What happens is there are people who are in the community for a while they, they show up and then they disappear. I don't know if later on we had some at the mosque, they, they showed up from somewhere else, they're not part of our community, and then they disappear and then you find out that they were on a terrorist watch list or something. 
And so I think that's really the phenomenon. But we don't know who they are. Without a doubt, let, let me let some because he, he's on the national level. He may have. I'll just add the one comment. The fact of the matter is, we know of no sleeper cells. We don't know of that phenomena to exist within our community. And the fact of the matter is, we have reiterated that what has protected our community far before 9/11 from extremism and from violent ideology is that balanced mainstream advocation of or advocacy of Islamic principles that has been the hallmark of mass and the hallmark of the Muslim community throughout and so we need not worry nor fear that threat because we in fact know having our hand on the pulse of the community that such threat does not exist and as such even if it surfaces secondary to any other reasons, it can be very easily spotted. We, are, we know, we are ready to, to root it out, and we have been engaged and doing for many, many years. And as far as our youth are concerned, you know, the, the, the youth work has been from the days of the 60s and, and, and way before then. It is something that is ongoing. It is something that we are reasserting the fact that it exists and that there's no need for us to worry and we as a community much as every other decent community here in the America are Im you know, immune and in fact ca way and able and capable to eliminate such threat within our community. But the, yeah, the program of training is a response to some of it. Yes. What is this some of it? Could you please tell us? The fact is that to be an upstanding citizen true to your values of Islam you have to be engaged in a self-development that perfects oneself. And that's to us is something that's part and parcel of our development program for our community. Along with it comes the balanced understanding of Islam. Along with it comes the need to outreach and to live responsibly in the, in the place and in the, in the time that you're in. Along with it comes being somebody who shuns away extremism and, 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 and calls for, for, for the balanced you know, way of life. So it, it's a natural process. It's something that's been done, being done. We're, we're maybe uh, showing it more, exposing it more, but the fact of the matter is that that's what protected our community throughout the, de the years. And until this day, there is no such thing as a sleeper cell and there's no such thing as a, a group of people that are conspiring to, to undermine our society and our people. May, 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 I, may I respond to this question out of my experience? Your, your quest, request for specificity yes, as sir. to who yes. the enemy is. Let me tell you as one who went through the counterintelligence operations directed at Martin Luther King Jr. in the decade of the 60s, and who in the decade of the 70s was chairman of a subcommittee investigating the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr and who in the decade of the 80s was a member of the Select Committee on Narcotics Abuse and Control. Mm. That your question is difficult to answer. The fact is we wrestle not against flesh and blood, That's right. but against spiritual wickedness right. in high places. The kind of spiritual wickedness that mass has resolved to confront. And I can tell you on basis of experiences in all three of those arenas, that spiritual wickedness comes from many sources. And we're serving notice on all of them. That's right. All of them. In government, in the counterintelligence operations, and among the hypocrites who use religion as an excuse to kill other people. That's right. We're coming. And we shall overcome. Okay. I'm going to recognize hands. hands. In order. Okay. Yes, please uh, go ahead. Uh, do any of you have a solution no, no, to how I, terrorists are imprisoned or no, held? Um, hello, one second. My hand was up. No, no, his hand's for yours. Thank you, Mama. Thank you. The uh, London Daily Telegraph found a story, I think it was Thursday or Friday. Uh, apparently, they've conducted a poll, and apparently 25% uh, of British Muslims, according to that story, uh, sympathize with those who blew up the underground. Uh, does, do you know of any similar studies conducted here? And if so, what would be the comparable figures, if any? Now, I don't know any recent polls, but uh, I do know a poll that was taken by the Pew Charitable Trust, I mean, the Pew uh, Research Foundation, which showed that there was minimal, very minimal, if any, support for uh, those type of activities in the United States. You have to understand also that there is a difference of, of uh, a simulation between uh, Muslims in Europe as opposed to those in the United States. And so th the uh, culturation factors also deal with that aspect. I would dare say that... Uh, and even those Muslims uh, in Europe would, would also say that certainly the American Muslim population is a lot more assimilated within its, its major society than perhaps many of our European 
our brothers and sisters in, of, 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 uh, of our same faith tradition. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take one. you have a solution to how terrorists in prison are held as enemy combatants should be dealt with religiously when held captive? Doesn't it appear that the United States government is sending a message to the rest of the world, particularly real Muslims, that these murdering, evil, intended terrorists are sincere, devout Muslims? Shouldn't these imposters and frauds be dealt with like infidels to Allah or pagans denying God's true character? Uh, couldn't the way the U.S. is acting in regards to these sinners bound for hell be sending a wrong message to Allah and God-loving believers everywhere in the Muslim world as much as anywhere? Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Sam. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think some of the... Uh, the we hold uh, true and dear the fact that Islamic principles are what we hold dear and close to our hearts. And we clearly see and, and interpret our Islam within the uh, mainstream, grounded in the very firm uh, scriptures and jurisprudence of Islam. And in no such place is there any argument or is there any place to justify uh, um, the senseless killing and the violence that is espoused. The Guantanamo is a whole political uh, situation that I don't think that we can draw similar or easy parallels to, but I will report one story of a person who, um, after invoking such ideas, he was dialogued with, and he, he was one of the leaders, reportedly, who has been taken to trusted scholars and sat and had dialogue, and, 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 uh, and uh, that resulted in him uh, renegating and, and removing all the uh, misunderstandings that they have. And that's what we think Islam has. Islam has the answers to all the uh, questions, even if they are out of anger and frustration. And none of them do channel through violence, and none of them channel through the uh, intolerance and, or the bigotry that is exhibited. And so we're very firm and we're very clear. But we're also very cognizant of the external factors and the counter bigotry that may result in the escalation of the environment that may lead to things like this. And so as proactive members of the community who are firm in their Islam and who are combating terrorism, we're alarmed and we want to see an end to that which creates the same atmosphere and the environment that will breed such things. And we talked about our domestic agenda and our international agenda because these issues weigh in very heavily in the, in the matter that, at hand. Jim Shea, in order for follow this Jim, campaign to be Jim, effective, Jim, Mufti, it's going to have to respond to the legitimate frustrations and anger within the Muslim community. Well, it's going to have to. Okay. And, and, and it sounds as if you don't even want to hear a question from someone that you know represents the grassroots, the street. Okay. Now, well, first of all, if you had come earlier, uh, dear, dear Mari, you would have heard us addressing that issue. And in fact, it was well laid out and articulated. And certainly, uh, no one wants to silence a grassroots member or any other member. Okay. Okay. And in any event, okay, if I can have the final question from Jim Shea, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Dr. Sam's comments on both the domestic and international agenda. Is this in any way with mass freedom or mass uh, organization going to affect? Is this moderating in any way the civil rights advocacy or even internationally the views on the Moss's views on the war on Iraq for some Absolutely not. In fact, we will be leading a major demonstration where we're expecting tens of thousands, perhaps a half a million people here on September the 25th to express our opposition to the war in Iraq. So we haven't moderated our views at all about that situation. We still feel very strongly about the war in Iraq, and we plan to articulate it uh, on September the 24th. I want, to thank every, I, want to thank every, I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to say uh, once again, uh, because of the time restraints, we're going to have to go. But in any event, I would like to say and close uh, with this, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, by the token of time, through the ages, verily all of humanity is in loss, except for those who have faith, do good deeds, and join together in the mutual teaching of truth, patience, and constancy. Thank you so very much. And thank you, C-SPAN. Thank you so much. Okay, all right.
Oh, thank you so very much. Let me give you my card. Thank you for the rest. But I consider you as nothing but a two-bit hustler. Okay, Mom. Do you know something? What I, what I, what I wanted to say here was, and now I think about it in the series, I'm going to put it on the right, and it's going to be more harsh than what it would have been. Believe me, I will. You know, I will. But what you you're watching public affairs programming on C-SPAN 2. Just ahead, a conversation on the Supreme Court. Later, Joint Chiefs Chair General Richard Myers on his recent meeting with his counterparts in Germany, Slovakia, and Ireland. Live coverage from the National Press Club starts at noon Eastern. The Senate is in later today. They start with a resolution marking the enactment of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Later, continued debate on Defense Department authorization for 2006. Watch live Senate coverage at 1 p.m. Eastern. C-SPAN's new Congressional Directory is your guide to government resources and information. The handbook has profiles and all.